Well, hello, and welcome back to Crucial Conversations. I'm Peter. And I'm Kevin. And this is our last episode of 2020. We thought it would never end. (laughs) The episode, or 2020, or the podcast, I don't know. But this is the last one. Not of the podcast, nor of the series. Kevin, I'm just being silly now. Can you, you say something to help get, get me out of the silliness? I don't. I don't, I don't know even know on. what you're talking about. So, <laughs> this is not the last of anything, nor is it the end of the year, but it might be when people are listening. Well, okay. or it could be the beginning of a new year. It, it could be when they're listening. Yeah, it's but, all about perspective. Yes, perspective matters. Mm-hmm. So we're continuing our series on hermeneutics, and today we're going to talk about John four. And the woman at the well, and particularly how many wrong ways there are to read this one that aren't about Jesus. Which seems really weird, because Jesus is there talking to her at the well, so you'd think we'd, we'd be able to make it about him. And, and yet we don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I think, I think that's, that's one of the most important things as we continue in the series, is to always go back and review some of the the basic things that we want to remember as you read the Bible is that first of all, we, we talk about the Christological principle, the idea that we read scripture focused on Jesus Christ, no matter where you find yourself in the Bible, old Testament, new Testament, what you want to ask is what is God doing? And specifically, what is he doing in Christ Jesus? Or what is, and when you're in the old Testament, you say, how is this fulfilled in Christ? And so, that's the first thing you want to do. And then you want to make sure that, that when you think about Christ, when you think about God working in Christ, that even that is focused, especially on his death and resurrection as kind of the culmination of his earthly ministry. You want to think also about his ascension and second coming in line with that. But the other thing that I want to call to mind is as we, as we think about this Christological principle, it's also really part of the the delineation of the kinds of books we're reading. And the reason I say that is because, as we talked about before, the four Gospels are really stories about the death and resurrection of Jesus. That's the climax of their narrative. That's the, the driving force in their narrative. And that really is the focus of these four writings. And that's one of the reasons that these four are the Gospels that we have is because these are the writings where the apostles told the story of Jesus' earthly ministry, really with the death and resurrection of Jesus as God's definitive action to save mankind, that is the point of their writing. And that, remembering that, really helps us to read the individual parts of the Gospels. So it's not just an overall idea, but it actually then helps you when you're reading these overall, or these these parts of the, of the overall book, a parable like we did last time <laughs> yep, or yep. a story that we have in John four with the woman at the well, or even a teaching of Jesus or a teaching of somebody else you read it and you say, okay, well, how does this drive the story, drive the reader, drive us as Christians to Jesus as God's definitive action to save mankind, especially through his death and his resurrection. So that's what we're going to work on today as we read John 4, is how do we do that? How do we read this story with these characters, with the the different narrative events, and and continue to examine the text and look for Christ and hear how God reveals his work in Christ to us in this story? Now, as we mentioned in the last episode, this is a longer account, so we'll kind of be skipping around and reading excerpts from it. But if you're just getting into this this podcast episode, it would be good for you to sit down yourself, pause if you're in a place where you can pause, and actually just read through the account so you have it fresh in your mind, uh, because we won't be doing that in this episode simply for the sake of time. But I say that now. And then I bet with the excerpts, we end up reading like most of it anyways. Yeah, we will. We'll read. However, (laughs) it's always a good practice for you, listener, to take a pause and read the scriptures that we're about to be talking through yourself. So, that way you can hold us accountable too, you know? Right. It's like, oh, they're they're a little bit crazy there. Where did that come from? All right, Kevin, take it away. So, without reading the entire story... We know the story of Jesus and the woman at the well 
uh, or the Samaritan woman at the well, depending how you want to title this little story. But it, it really is the story of John chapter 4, beginning at verse 7. And it goes in many ways through uh, verse 42. So um, there's a little bit of discussion with the disciples in there, but, but for the most part, the story of Jesus and the woman at the well, the Samaritans, goes from John 4, 7 through John 4, 42. So it's a long story. There's dialogue. Um, Jesus and the woman have a little discussion. There's also dialogue with Jesus and then his disciples. There's dialogue that we don't get to hear between the Samaritan woman and her, the people that she lives with in her town. So her townspeople or her fellow Samaritans. Mm -hmm. So there, there's a lot going on here. There's some discussion that, that is almost comical in its misunderstanding. There's some discussion that's surprising in the answers that Jesus gives. And there's some conversation that um, is quite shocking for, for a reader of scripture. Maybe the first time you've come across this story and yeah. maybe you're not expecting this to be in the Bible, but there it is. Yep. Which, which is also part of us reading um, scriptural narrative and we'll talk about that as well. So, so the basic premise is this, is that Jesus is, I mean, I said it starts verse seven, but that the, it's set up really in verse five. So he's, he's passing through Samaria and he goes to a place called Sikar, which is near a Jacob's field that he gave to Joseph. And there's a well there and Joseph, and Jesus is tired, which is again, a very interesting notion to think about with Jesus. He gets tired. And so he's sitting there beside the well and it's about the sixth hour, which don't worry about the timing too much. <laughs> and, and then verse seven is kind of the, the conflict of the story. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water and Jesus said to her, give me a drink. So right away you have conflict set up between the idea of Jews and Samaritans with Samaritans, these people that Jews don't associate with normally considered them uh, syncretistic because they worshiped false gods kind of in concert with their worship of Yahweh. Um, they actually had a different version of the Torah they read. They worshiped hmm. on a different place than the Jews. Their yep. history was kind of a, a mixed breed kind of people where they, back in their past, there was some intermarriage due to the Assyrian um, exile and, and conquering of their nation. So, so Jews and Samaritans didn't really associate very well. And then you have um, a Jewish man and a Samaritan woman um, at this well kind of having a conversation privately, which causes some other questions of propriety and and yeah that, that's not something you would normally do right whether or not this is this is the proper thing so then on top of all that you have the woman of samaria who goes there to get water for herself and jesus says to give him water which is a little weird and then <laughs> it just gets even weirder and then when when the conversation is struck up between the Samaritan woman and Jesus, Jesus says to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. And, and she's like, great. I never have to come back here. Well, the first thing she says is that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> right. You're sitting at a well with nothing to draw water from the well with. And you're offering me water. Why would I ask you for water when you ask me to get you something to drink and you don't have anything to get water with? <laughs> and, <laughs> and now Jesus is a crazy person. Right. And then he says, well, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But verse 14, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty forever. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And then she says, this is great. Like you said, this yeah. is great. I will I never take, have to come back here again. Yes, I will take yep. your never-ending flow of water any day. This sounds good. And right away, we have this very strange conversation going on. There's conflict. There's misunderstanding. There's 
um, there's mundane kind of juxtaposed with the spiritual promises of eternity. There's foreshadowing. There's rehearsing things that have come before in the gospels, all kinds of things going on in this narrative. And we're not even really into the heart of the story yet. Yep. So what happens is we get very distracted when we read this story and we start thinking through um, who are the Samaritans? Who are the Jews? Who is this woman? What does she represent? You so, know. So let me let me take a little bit of a crack at that because I think I've heard some of the some of these distractions, and I, I think one of the most common ways it, it might come about is something like this. We had an episode on critical theory and viewing everything through the lens of oppression and how that's not biblical. And so I'm going to take that lens and kind of impose it on this text because in many American churches, especially if they're more theologically liberal, uh, you'll hear this a lot, but even within our own more conservative churches, if we're not careful, this, this kind of slips in. So everybody is oppressed or an oppressor. And so here is, here is Jesus, he's the male, so he's the oppressor asking the woman who is in the oppressed category for a drink. So he's making demands of her. Now, it's inappropriate for a, a male to be talking to a female in that context. But the more important thing is she's a Samaritan who are the oppressed by the Jews. The Jews oppress the Samaritans. She is a, a woman of a Samaritan. So she's got two things where she's being oppressed here as well. Um, this is also important because here is John having this account of a woman and having the woman talk and having her being a main character in this, talking to Jesus. And so John is also trying to tell us, let's look at this narrative. This is important. He's allowing a woman to speak and he's allowing a woman later on in the account to be a witness to the gospel. And so here is Jesus coming in and and the oppressed giving them a voice and taking away the power from the oppressor and giving it to the oppressed. This sounds crazy. I mean, it sounds kind. Of, it might sound a little bit silly, but this is actually kind of, kind of how it goes. And you can just kind of see how this flows through the entire narrative. Now, now the woman has been empowered to go speak. Now, there's this little interlude here where she's actually got like multiple husbands, and the one she's living with isn't actually your husband. We're just going to ignore that. You know, we're we're not going to really talk about that, other than to point out. Oh, look once again. This makes her part of the oppressed. She's ostracized within that community. So it's an even more, a, a detail that even helps more with her being oppressed and in, in that particular category. And notice how the entire narrative at this point has completely shifted away from Christ and who he is and is all about this woman being empowered, this woman having a voice, this woman being lifted up, raised up by Jesus, how this is Christ's justice and this is his mercy and, you know, any other number of things comes into this, um, in, into this narrative. That, that sound, if you're coming from a more conservative background, a conservative church, that might sound a little bit crazy, but that is actually something that you might hear if you're coming from a more liberal or you're following your theology on Facebook. <laughs> okay, Kevin, anything to add to that or anything you might might tweak a little bit uh, with, with that example of where this ends up going very, very badly? So that's right. So what happens a lot in these, in these um, interpretations or these readings is that we concentrate on these minor characters and make them really the focus of the narrative. And then we pretend that what the, what the scriptures is teaching us is kind of how Jesus treated these people the outsiders the oppressed the the minorities whatever you want to label them and we pretend that the message of the new testament is that jesus really treasured these people when other people don't and so we should learn to be like jesus <laughs> and we like i said we certainly do want to acknowledge that there is a conflict in jew and samaritan here but we don't want to minimize but I think a faithful reading of the Gospel of John would not allow us to say that the point of the story is the way that Jesus treats this woman from from that point of view. Mm 
Mm -hmm. What we would like to learn from the Gospel of John is what God and John both intend for us to learn from the Gospel of John. And many of you know that the Gospel of John is my favorite of the Gospels um, for various and sundry reasons. But one of the reasons is because I'm a very simple person. Simple and sinful, depending on how you heard that, they're both true. Yeah. Uh, but John tells us at the end of the book, he knows people like me will be reading it, so he just tells us at the end why he wrote it. So if you go to John chapter 20, verse 30 and 31, this is the, the author of the book telling us, the reader, exactly why this book was written and how we are to read it. And we've referenced this passage in multiple podcasts, too. It's and a great we'll just one. keep doing it. Yeah, <laughs> so kind of need to. It says, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of, of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So... When you take John's own words seriously about the book that he wrote, this story, he chose the, this story to record in his gospel so that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ. Now go back and reread the story. Mm-hmm. See, what happens is in all this dialogue, what finally happens is that the discussion in verse 25 actually ends up with a woman saying to him, now I know, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called the Christ. And and remember, just Bible review, Messiah is the Hebrew word, which is translated into Greek in Christ. They both mean anointed one. So mm-hmm. if you say anointed one in Hebrew, it's Messiah. If you say anointed one in Greek, it's Christ. If you say anointed one in English, it's anointed one because we're speaking English, okay? So so Messiah and Christ are the same word in two different languages, both being anointed one. So the woman says to him, the Samaritan woman says, I know that the Christ or the Messiah is coming. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. And this is really the point of the story is that Jesus is revealed as the Christ in this story, as the promised Messiah. And when we understand that that's really the focus of the story, what we'll see is that there's there's other revelatory statements in the story that help us understand what's going on in the gospel. So when you look through the story of Jesus and the woman, what you notice right away, just a cursory reading of the story, nothing complicated, mm-hmm. is that there's water. There's just water. Right? They're at a well. Okay. They're talking about yeah. drinking water, drawing welling, living water. Don't have to get here and then we're thirst. It's just water, right? Well, yeah. we just read chapter three where Jesus actually says to Nicodemus that in verse five of chapter three, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit. And the spirit, yeah. He cannot enter the kingdom of God. And now the next story is about water and it's living water that never ends and the previous story to the samaritan in chapter four is also about water and now we have water and like you said living water we have the promise that in verse 14 the water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water rolling up to eternal life, which pushes us ahead to chapter 7 in John, where Jesus says that the, when he gives a spirit, the spirit will be a spring of living water. Uh-oh. Now we have spirit and water connected. Mm. And if yep. you go down, you have, in verse 23, they... they this is a very strange move. This this woman goes from talking about water to talking about her living situation to talking about the proper way to worship. Very interesting, okay? So, but then listen to what Jesus says. She asked about how, how do you worship, where do you worship? And he says this, but the hour is coming is now here when those who worship this, worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. So now we have water, spirit, truth, well, what's going on here? 
And and what you have going on is the themes of the Gospel of John are being brought together, and all of it culminates then in the identification of Jesus as Messiah. I was just going to say, John likes to talk about those three things throughout his Gospel. They are constantly coming up. Always. Yep. And and when you start reading this and say that this story is actually a further revelation of Jesus as the Christ, the Son of God, and that the point of the story is that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and by believing have life in his name, then you realize that this is not a story about the woman at the well. This is the story about Jesus. Well, and and so looking at it that way, you can also see her realizing who he is through this account because she has she has her first statement of well you know give me this water that that's forever great that's nice he then tells her everything about her which Mm -hmm. is what she says later and she's like wait a minute you're not just this weird guy saying this weird thing you you sound like a prophet well i'm going to ask you about this worship thing let's talk about that and his answer to that further reveals to her who he is and you just see her progressing to where at the end she's running into town saying, hey, guys, I found the Messiah. Like, her, wh- how, wh- if we're going to say this story is about her in any way, it's about her realizing that Jesus is the Messiah. As in, she has now heard the word yeah, and believed that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and by believing has life eternal life in yeah. his name this is the role of the samaritan woman is to exemplify to the reader that by hearing the word we believe that jesus is the christ now here's the thing the word that she hears doesn't make any sense to her at all <laughs> right it's total nonsense She's almost like, all the way through what are you talking about living water that sounds good that means it's maybe coming from a spring so i don't come to a well and maybe you can get it to my house somehow so i don't have to come out here and draw water that sounds great and he's like that's not what i'm talking about he's like okay let's try again go call your husband and she's like uh oops well <laughs> see i don't have a husband and jesus says right yeah okay so here's the thing you've had five and the one you're with now is not your husband And she, this is the amazing thing. She doesn't say, get out of my business. Stop oppressing me. Stop judging me. Leave me alone. She doesn't. She actually says to Jesus, I perceive that you are a prophet. And then she asks him the question about how to properly worship God and where. And that the pronouncement of law by Jesus drives her to repentance and the desire to properly worship God. And what we see is that the effect of Jesus speaking the law is to drive a sinner to the desire to worship properly. And what he tells her is the proper worship is in spirit and truth. And then this is the one who says, I will give you the Holy Spirit, and I am the way, the truth, and the life. Mm -hmm. And what she learns is the only proper worship of God is to believe that Jesus is Messiah. And that's exactly what she says. So what we learn is that this story continues the narrative of the Gospel of John to reveal exactly who Jesus is and drives us to the place where his mission to save this Samaritan woman from her sins, to deliver her fellow villagers from their sins, to save Nicodemus in chapter three from his sins, to save the the man he's gonna heal at the pool in chapter five from his sins, to save the disciples from their sins and the Pharisees from their sins. All of this work is finally when Jesus is exalted. He says, when I am finally exalted, when I am lifted up from the earth, then all people will know that I am he. And so this entire narrative draws to, he is the Christ, the son of God, and you see it in the cross because that's where he accomplishes the salvation of mankind. And then you say, but you said in his life, in his name, we have life. And you say, yeah, because three days later, he 
rose again. And mm-hmm. just as he rose, so all who believe in him and call upon his name will rise. So I want to see if we can tie this to our, our last episode where we talked about the parable of the sower. Because I think there's a couple important things, I think, you can you can tell me if I'm thinking correctly here, Kevin. There, there's a couple of things going on here. First of all, remember the parable of the sower is all about the proclamation of God's word, the proclamation of the kingdom of heaven, or the kingdom of God. Kingdom of heaven, which kingdom of God. Matthew's Same thing. kingdom, yeah, but Matthew prefers kingdom of heaven, right? Mm-hmm. And Luke does kingdom of God. So, same thing. Here, we see that same proclamation happening. Yep. Here, here it is. And notice John, the whole point of John including this is because John wants to point out to us, look, here's that proclamation happening. John is very explicit like you, like you read earlier, and we, we're proclaiming this so that you might believe. Okay, here, here it is being proclaimed. Now, Kevin, can I look at this and maybe wonder what type of soil that woman is, or am I going too far? Does that actually help us in this at all, if, or should we keep it at the level of well, what, proclamation if you're gonna, of the kingdom? So there's always a little bit of danger in reading John in light of Matthew or vice versa because they weren't ah. written necessarily to be read in that way. But, but sure. as we see it as all the word of God, it certainly is going to have parallels in the ministry of Jesus. And what we actually see, as we talked about with, with the parable of the sower, was that Jesus, although he's going to be received by a few – he will largely be rejected for his proclamation of the kingdom. And that is indeed exactly what happens to Jesus. So you say, whoa, this story is great. He goes, she believes, she tells her whole village, they all believe, they come out to Jesus, they invite him back to their village to hang out and tell tell them about the kingdom of God and to teach, and this is just wonderful. And then he heals a guy's son, he heals a guy by a pool, and everybody loves Jesus. And then, um, in the middle of of chapter 5, you hear this. And this is why the Jews were persecuting Jesus, because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, my father is working until now, and I am working. And this is why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill Jesus. I mean, it's just, it's not going well, right? Because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. And so what we have, just like the parable of the sower, is we have a few, right? Remember, one-fourth of the soil does bear fruit. But for the most part, Jesus, as he goes, is going to face rejection. So the Jews reject Jesus, and and if you read the rest of chapter five, he basically tells them that you're never gonna understand me because you don't understand that the Old Testament was written all about me. And as long as you refuse to believe in who I am, you will never understand the word of God, never. And, and what you've just done also highlights another important point in making sure we're keeping these passages in context. Because if we just take the woman at the well as a standalone, this is all there is, and we're not careful to read through all the way like you did and highlight, if we're look, if we're going to look at this as the proclamation, like the parable of the sower, we need to keep going in mm-hmm. in that to look at the full picture. Is, we, we haven't talked – well, we've talked about scripture and context and how context mm-hmm. matters and – um, that, that's the integrity principle, isn't it? That's where we and, right. and coherence. And coherence. To agree. Yep. To bo- both of those. But the the point being, so maybe I might have had a little bit of a point, but even in that, it's easy to completely go wrong if I'm not careful to not just follow the Christological principle, but here's the coherence and integrity principles. I can't go too far off with those, or I actually begin losing the Christological principle because once again. I start focusing on the soil <laughs> and the right. and the quality of the soil and the it's quality like, of the soil ah! and and we know how hard a time I had with that last <laughs> last episode <laughs> and what we want really want to do and the commonality that you are pointing toward is is the correct one that the real commonality is Jesus as the one who is speaking and enacting 
the kingdom of God through his earthly ministry, yeah. what which is culminates God doing? exactly Back to that question. What is exactly. God doing? And and with the Gospel of John, then the question is, who is this Jesus? Right. Mm-hmm. So remember, when you read the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they're talking about the kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven, and their answer to that is that Jesus is the victor. He finally conquers sin, death, and devil. He conquers the fallen creation. He he fixes it. You know he he conquers sin as he as he heals disease. He conquers the devil as he casts out demons. All these things you see it in the gospels, right? Mm-hmm. Even as he faces opposition, it looks like he's being conquered. In reality, he wins. And so Matthew, think of the Gospel of Matthew, right? At the end of the gospel, he stands and he goes, "All authority, Look, yeah, all of it, <laughs> everything. It's all mine. It's mine, right? Yep. And how did he do that? By suffering and dying, hmm. and rising again." Okay, so that's very much a synoptic gospel way of doing things. In the gospel of John, he does that, but but his concentration is really that Jesus is coming to reveal a hidden reality that earthly eyes can't see. You have to you have to believe it by the power of the Spirit in order to understand it. And so mm. a lot of what's happening is Jesus is doing these things, and the question is, okay, you're doing that, but who are you? And who do you claim to be? And that's where Jesus gets in trouble is whenever he starts explaining why he's doing these things and who he is, that's when the crowds turn on him. That's mm-hmm. when the opposition comes. It's not people in the gospel of John are not upset with him for doing miracles. Yeah. They like the miracles. They're, they like they're the cool. healings because they're getting a benefit from that. This is they, great. I'm they not They like lame the feeding anymore. the 5,000. This is yep, great. I don't have to go hungry. We don't have food. to work for food. We don't work for yep. bread. It's just you're going to give it to us. But then it, then he starts talking about what this means and who he is, that he's the bread of life, that he's the, the bread even of the Old Testament, mm-hmm. right? <laughs> yeah. I'm the actual manna. And they're going, what? You're out of your mind. You can't be that. And yep. even even his disciples, not the 12, but his other disciples, even walk away from him, right? Because they hear him making these claims about who he is. And as we continue to read through the Gospel of John, obviously, read the Gospel of John. It's the best gospel. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. All four are well, equally Well, now good. we go back to our Bible yeah, reading plan. We exactly. We recommend starting with the Gospel yeah. of John. So. And as you read the Gospel of John, one of the things to do with all the different characters you meet and all the different situations you meet, all the different, um, the seven signs and all those things, is continue to listen to the titles that describe Jesus. And you hear Son of Man, Son of God, Messiah, which again is Christ, mm-hmm. um, the King of Israel, and all these things, he's he makes himself David. equal to God. All these things keep piling up in the Gospel of John. And and as you get to the end then, remember, John says, I wrote these things that you would believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And here's John's point. And by believing, you get life. It's yeah. not by emulating him. It's not by going out and saving the the oppressed. It's not by learning to treat people the way he treats people. That's not the point. The point is believe. Believe in who Jesus is and what he did on the cross for you. And in that, you get eternal life. And when someone says, well, you know, the woman at the well is a story about oppression and freeing someone from oppression. And we, we want to acknowledge without any hesitation that, that this is certainly an amazing text where a Jewish Messiah saves a Samaritan sinner. I was going to say, we, we didn't talk about this, but part of that proclamation theme is that it is for everyone. Right. It's not exclusively for the Jews. Now, Jesus will talk at times about, I'm starting there. Yeah. That, that's where we're starting. But this is a very clear example of, uh, we're not keeping this to ourselves. This this will go to everyone. And but, like you said, at the end of Matthew, he explicitly says, go everywhere. Go everywhere. Tell everybody. <laughs> All the nations. <laughs> and so what happens is that she's not singled out because she's oppressed. She's not singled out because... She's a Samaritan or a woman. She's actually singled out because she's a sinner. Hmm. And she's a sinner for whom Christ came. And this is the amazing news of the Gospel of John and the other Gospels and Paul's writing and even the Old Testament when you read it properly is that this God who loves so much that he sent his son to die and rise for the sins of the people, this God loves 
And don't forget that the, the Bible verse that everybody knows so well is actually in the Gospel of John and is actually hey, in the in previous the chapter. chapter. Yep. That's right, where it says, for God so loved the world. And so the question is, does that world involve a Pharisee who is the teacher of Israel who comes to Jesus at night with questions? Does, it in, does that world include Nicodemus? Hmm. Answer, yes. Yeah. Does that world include John the Baptist and his disciples? Yes. Now, does that world include Samaritans? Yes. And even a Samaritan woman who has not made very good choices yeah. At least, at least in one area of her life, right? Bad, bad now, let's life choices, as I tell my kids. <laughs> let's not label her as any worse than me. Sure, because we know the bad choices she has made in one area of her life. We are all sinners. Yeah. Who, if we were sitting with Jesus and He was talking to us, He could easily look at us and say, "Why don't you go do this?" And we would say, um, "Well, you see, I haven't made the best choices in that area." So I think once again, what you've done there has been very helpful with, if we're going to talk about the integrity principle and the coherence principle, help us helping us focus back on that Christological one is once again, let's put that in context with the world. And then we can see these examples of who is included in the world. Because one of my, one of my thoughts was, well, Kevin, this makes this passage kind of boring. We've taken all the all the fun stuff out of it, all the controversy out of it. It's just another passage that talks about, you know, Jesus and, and the proclamation of his kingdom, which my my very next thought was, ooh, that's that's kind of a response of unbelief. Well <laughs> if I think that's actually boring, See, here's the thing. If you... I think that that's taken the life out of the passage because I don't get my controversial details anymore. Uh, that's well now we're showing my areas of sin <laughs> well I know we're at the end of the episode but just to yeah. just to whet your appetite for reading the Bible there there's more fun stuff to read when you read it correctly <laughs> and the amazing thing is when you read this story and you realize that this is a scene at a well that discusses marriage you start realizing that this is actually something from the Old Testament where Moses met his wife at a well. Wasn't this actually Jacob's well? Jacob met his wife at a well. And this is actually a reference to Jacob's well. And you go back and you read the Old Testament and you say this, when people meet at a well, we're going to soon talk marriage. And Mm. what happens with Jesus and the Samaritan woman is we're soon talking marriage. And then you say, well, why is that important? You say, because marriage is in the Old Testament is a metaphor for worship. One man, one woman, one God, one God to worship. And when you Hmm. start messing up marriage and having too many wives or or not being faithful to your husband, then you are actually guilty of idolatry. And this is exactly where the conversation goes in John chapter four. We have a well, we have conversations about marriage, and we have conversations about worship and And if you want to get even more exciting you go to revelation where oh look john has conversations about marriage and conversations about worship and these are huge pictures huge pictures in the book of revelation which is also what he wrote which is as he starts off the revelation of Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. So, okay, yeah, that's, we, we should probably stop or we'll just keep going. Yeah, well, but. it does keep going because then you <laughs> then you think, okay, now we have marriage and worship and syncretism, which I said is a worship of, of many gods, not just not just the true God. And then all of a sudden you have these, these ideas of the exile, that God's people are actually exiled because of their idolatry, because of their unfaithfulness. Mm. And now you have a Samaritan who the Samaritans were half-breeds as a result of that exile. And the hope of both the Samaritans and the Jews was that the Messiah would come to end the exile. And guess what she talks about next? Messiah. Messiah, yeah. (laughs) I mean, you you just, there's such a richness to to reading the Bible and getting these narratives in your head that that it just, it's actually not boring when you start reading it and you yeah, don't have to yeah. go to these crazy ideas that we're importing into the Bible. Just read the text itself and listen to the richness of God's revelation for just how deep his love is for you. 
that you as a sinner don't deserve any of this, but he works through all of these things to provide his son, Jesus Christ, to be the salvation for sinners. And that includes you. You are loved by God. And that is the crucial conversation. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, if you've got questions, if you, like I said in our last episode, if you want us to go through a Bible passage and kind of give it this treatment, send an email to questions at crucialproductions.org. Go to our website, crucialproductions.org. Click the Ask a Question up there at the top. Hey, if you've appreciated our podcast this year, if you also give like a five-star review on iTunes, that actually helps people find it and see it. Podcasts that are reviewed well on the different platforms tend to show up higher in those algorithm rankings. If you're listening in on YouTube, give it a like, maybe drop a comment about what you've appreciated. Same thing there. You know, the algorithms like it when people interact with the content. Um, and when that happens, more people will see it. So we, we appreciate that, that little bit of effort on your part. You want to go one step further. You can financially support us. We are a nonprofit here in the United States. We're a recognized service organization of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Head on over to crucialproductions.org slash give if you want to financially support us here at the end of the year. And as I always say, after you've supported your church, make sure you're supporting the work of your local congregation first. And if you really, really, really love us. Whoa, wait, what, what, there's more? You could just order a pizza for us. Oh, but if you really, 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 really love us, then you can just read the Bible and share it with your family, with your friends, encourage them to read the Bible along with yeah. you and spend time in the word. Our, our favorite comments are the ones where I, th- I think one of my favorite comments so far on any of our stuff is on the Habakkuk and five video that we put out where one individual said, I was always scared to read the Old Testament. It was confusing. I always get it wrong. But now that I've seen this video, I just want to go read Habakkuk now. I'm, I'm, I'm yeah, excited to get exactly. into that. That is still one of my favorite comments on anything because that's what we want to see happening with, with what we're doing. So oh, I, I'm hoping after the last episode, you went back and read the parable of the sower. And, and this episode, if you didn't pause it and read John 4, that once you're done, you'll go out and read John 4 as quickly as you can, and 3 and 5, since we showed how they all fit together. <laughs> mm-hmm. you just, so, just keep reading the whole gospel. Might yeah, as well. well, you know, but it, yeah. <laughs> yes, that. I was going to give a caveat, but I'm like, wait, you can't give a caveat to that. There's, that's right, that's, just read it. It doesn't work. All right. Well, thank you guys for joining us here in 2020. We'll see you guys next year. See ya.